Welcome to First Rule Baptist Church. Um, it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, Tony's over here playing cowbell, so I told him more cowbell. Amen, Tony? Mississippi State, yeah, yeah. Pray for Tony. Um, we welcome you here to First Rule Baptist Church again. Let's all stand together and start our service off with a, uh, a great old hymn, uh, There is Power in the Blood. Now listen, when we sing this, uh, we sung this in early service this morning, and let's keep this going. When we sing this, let's really believe there is power in the blood. Amen. There is power in His blood this morning and in, in, in saving grace of Jesus Christ this morning. So as we sing this, we're going to sing the first, uh, third, and last. It should be on the wall for you. Let's sing this together, okay? Sing it out. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood sing out there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb all the last okay we sing this chorus sing it out would you do service for Jesus your king there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Sing it out. Here we go. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's continue to worship him through song this morning. Let's sing this together. Lord, I lift your name on high.
morning we lift his name on high. Amen? Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship him this morning, we're going to sing this next chorus, You Are Worthy. It's been a while since we've sung this. I think in our planning center it's been maybe about seven or eight months. But this, this chorus is beautiful because it says you are worthy. He is worthy this morning of our praise. Amen? He is worthy. He is sitting on high. He reigns over us forever. He will reign. Amen? As we learned in Sunday school this morning, He will reign forever. Amen? We trust our Lord and Savior this morning to come and meet with us today, not only in the worship time as we call the singing time, but we trust that our Father is going to come this morning through His Word that He's given Mitch this morning. I trust this morning that He will give me in His Word what I need to hear. Not what I want to hear, but what I need to hear. And this morning as, as we come together as a church, I pray that's your prayer this morning too. That we are just like sponges to His Word this morning. Because His Word is beautiful. It is beautiful. So as we sing this chorus, guys, don't pay attention to anybody beside of you. Just lift it up and just pure praise. Grab a hold of God's heart this morning and tell Him you love Him. and He is worthy of our praise this morning. Let's sing this together. This morning for who he is in our lives. You guys can be seated. Good morning. Man, he is worthy, amen? It excites me to hear that song. And, and what I want to share with you today is, is for a reason, I think. I think God's presence is here. I think his Holy Spirit is very evident. And I want, to know, I want us to know that church is not just a format, right? Church is not just a habit. Church is not just a place to come and, and share on Sunday that God is our Savior. We, just, we need to do that every day. Amen. I want to share with you today. It's going to be a very simple sermon. I, I want to talk about it. I'm not going to 
talk about any scripture that you haven't heard before. Matter of fact, I'm going to be talking about a guy that's very common to every one of us. I'm going to be talking about Noah, okay? So I want you to go ahead and pray with me right now in a minute. I want you to go ahead and block the boat out of your minds, okay? Now, I don't want to cheapen the ark by any means. For God's sakes, I named my youngest son Noah. That's where you laugh. I don't want to cheapen the miracle at all because what he did was very big, okay? What he did in, in, in building this boat was huge, but I, if I can, I want to jump ahead for just a second, and I want to let us know that, that you know, my, my vision for our children, and, and being a student pastor, I want to share that with you real quick. My vision for our children is K through whatever, at a young elementary age, I want to see our children learn the principles of God. And when I say principles, church, let me tell you, when I say principles, I, I want them to know about God parting the Red Sea and those people walking across on dry land to safety. Amen? That's the God we serve. I want them to know the detail of Noah of the cubits, of the length and the height and the width and everything, where a window went, what the door did, who shut it and who didn't. And all the animals can be a discussion. And all that, I want the children to hear about that. Because those are things in their heart, that's things in our lives that we have to embrace that allows us to grow those principles. But I want to share with you this morning that it goes deeper than just the principles. I think as a church, I think as First Free Will Baptist Church, that we have to learn to take these principles and make them practices in our everyday life. Amen? Until they come to be practices, they're not sufficient for a people out here that don't know Jesus Christ. I tell my students all the time, there's little gauges in our cars. Listen, even Hope knows what the H and the C stands for, right? Tell us what the H stands for, Hope. Come on now, don't let me down. <laughs> Hot. Hot the, and cold. Thank you, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Hope knows, being a woman, what the gauges in her car is hot and cold. She knows what those mean. Now, I think that we can go a step further and look at the gauges that Christ has placed in our lives and, and, and know and depend on these gauges, whether we need to step it up or whether we need to back down, whether we need to move fast, whether we need to move whatever. I think that we can look at these gauges and if there's people in our lives, if there's people in our families, if there's people in our workplaces that are not coming to know Christ and believing in Him and acting upon Him, accepting the free gift, it may be our fault of not taking God's principles that we have dearly held on to and not making them these practices that we dearly need to turn loose of. Amen? So I think that's a perfect gauge. If we want to see people saved, if we want to see people come into this church, and I'm going to be honest with you, okay? Don't take me wrong on this. You can bring Billy Graham in here to pastor this church. I'm talking at 40 years old and in his prime. But until we take God's principles and turn them into his practices, it's all for zero. Amen? That's where we have to learn today. So I want us right now, as we go into a time of prayer, in Proverbs 3, the Word tells us that we have to trust in God. We can't lean on our own understanding, but rather we have to trust in God for His leadership, for His guidance, and for His wisdom. And that may be all we have to stand on. The path may be very foggy. The journey may be very cloudy. We don't have to understand everything, guys, to follow Jesus Christ. And today, I want to go into some detail and give you reasons of why that we can trust God. 
But I want you to pray with me as we open in prayer and I want you to ask God to get your mind seriously, to take your mind off of the boat, even though I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. I want us to take our mind off the boat. The focal point cannot be the boat today, but it can be the trust that Noah displayed. And let me go ahead and share with you, there's been many people throughout the 12 years that my youngest son Noah has been alive, they've come to him and cracked jokes about, hey man, you gonna build a boat? I wish he could build a boat, really. I'd li I love fishing and I'd have him build me a John boat. But anyway, there's people comes to him and says, man, are you gonna work forever on this boat? You're gonna build it because it's getting ready to rain and all that, and that's cool, that's all joke. But you know what, never has anybody ever came and said, hey dude, I want you to grow up Noah and I want you to have the trust like that Noah did. I want you to trust in our Savior. Man, that's what it's going to take to reach your family. That's what it's going to take to reach your uh, strangers, enemies, and whoever. You trust like Noah did. And you're going to reach people. So pray with me and ask God, listen, even through a simple story, but truth, even through a simple story like Noah, and we've taught our children these principles, guys. We've taught them they know the boat but they've got to turn the trust into the practices of their lives. We know the boat, but we must change this principle and turn it into a practice in our everyday life and show people out there, even when we're confused, even when the thing, everything seems dark, even during the time, listen to me, even during time of persecution, we can still trust our Lord and Savior. Man, is that not enough today to say thank you, Jesus, for who you are? Pray with me. God, speak to our hearts today. I thank you for the story of Noah. I thank you for the boat. And I thank you for the commitment. But God, I pray today thanking you for the trust that one of your servants that's no different than anybody in this room right now, Father. I thank you for the very trust that he displayed. Thank you for that example. Thank you for the influence. Now speak to our hearts as we recap in your, in your, in your scripture. I pray as we read, God, that you would allow us, give us things that we haven't seen before. And allow us to turn these principles into the very practices we need to practice for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Genesis chapter 6, I want to start in verse 9. And I'm going to read through 22. And I just, want to, uh, I just want to read through the story. And again, you're going to hear the story about the dimensions and all that, th all that stuff. And, uh, and again, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to discount. I'm not trying to disrespect the work and the work ethic and everything that, that Noah did. Because truly it's a miracle. But I think we need to step a step further. And I think that we need to inhabit, incorporate, whatever you want to call it. I think we need to take trust and put it in our hearts that we today make the focal point be that we strive starting today to be a better Christ follower. If you believe that, if you agree with that, and if you want to do that, please join me in saying amen right now. Amen. So let's all listen to God's word as we read starting in verse 9 of Genesis 6. And let's try to be open-minded and apply God's word to our heart. This is the genealogy of Noah. I love this first verse, chapter, verse 9. It says, Noah was a just man. Underline that, okay? Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Now, we're going to get into the reasons here in a little while why Noah walked with God. I'm going to give you some reasons why I think that, that God's Word explains why he was so confident, why he was so trustworthy, and all those things. I'm going to give you some of those in a few minutes. But man, the important part right now is to understand it doesn't matter how well of a carpenter, it doesn't matter how well of a fisherman, it doesn't matter how well of a caretaker that Noah was. He was a man that walked in favor with God. We all have that capability. If you're a Christ follower, you have the capability to follow Christ wholehearted just as Noah did right here. So I love that first verse in verse 9. Verse 10 says, And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. 
So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now listen, if we could stop right there for just a second, what I want you to do is again, I want you to take your mind off the boat. I wanna place you in this little building or, or on the side of a, a trail or somewhere where you may even think, and it doesn't really matter as long as you get the point here, I want you to think of somewhere where God came up and said, okay, Noah, here we go. It's time for you and I to talk. And I can see, I can see God just plainly sit down and just look at Noah right in the eyes and Noah sitting there saying, oh my, what's this gonna consist of? And, and I, don't, I honestly don't think that we've ever stopped long enough to think about the conversation here. But during this next few scripture that I read, starting at verse 13, I want you to think about, I want you to embrace the moment, what's going through Noah's mind. I want you to think about how you may react today if God come and sat down and said, here's what I want you to do, okay? And I'll go a step further, even though we've seen rains, even though we've seen floods, I still would like for you to stop and think if God commissioned you or commanded you to do this, where would you be today in this trust issue? Okay, so just kind of think of that. Verse 13, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Can you see Noah with his old pencil and paper taking notes as fast as he can? This is what I've got to do. And I doubt it. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits and it's height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it with a cubit from above and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark. You, your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten and you shall gather it to yourself and it shall be food for you, for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God, listen, underline verse 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Now, if you could for a second, just stop and embrace this conversation. It takes your mind strictly off of the boat. I don't think about the boat as much in this conversation. If I become a part of that, I think about the responsibility. I think about the commitment level. I think about the confidence. I think about the task at hand. And it's no different, guys than what God has commanded you and I through the Great Commission. He tells us to go and make disciples. He doesn't say go and build a boat, but he says go and make disciples. And that means to all people. That means that we have to be ready. That means that we have to be willing. That means that we have to be confident to go and do what he told us to do. It's not about the boat. I see Noah sitting here trying to wrap all this in his mind and he's thinking about, man, what is going on here? What is going on with this? What is God actually calling me to do? Do you think he done that? I doubt it, but I know I would. But we wonder, man, in thinking about this, about the conversation, we think about 
what must have been what it must have been like for God to reach the place. Listen, it'd be hard to swallow that God got to the place and he told Noah, listen, I'm gonna send waters and I'm destroying everything except you, your family, and the animals that I have asked you to, to keep. It'd be hard to wrap your mind around that. But to go on, we ponder even on the scientific results of this type of flood event. It almost seems impossible that it could even happen, and we've seen floods. But do you know, do you understand, even going back to the boat, that, that, that Noah trusted God? He had to. He spent over 100 years, guys, building a boat, and he'd never seen rain. Students, are you listening? He had never seen a rain because the earth was watered from the ground up, called dew. So he went into this commitment, not with knowledge, right? But with trust. With trust in whom? In God. There's no other way. There was no other way that he could have been that committed for a hundred plus years to building something that he had never seen function. Can you imagine this? Wrap your mind about, embrace this for a second. Put yourself, think about for just a second. Think about a time in your life, and it may be happening right now. Maybe this is what God wants to speak to you about. I don't know. But think about a time when you go through persecution. It's hard to function for Christ, amen? It's hard to function for the concern and maybe the worry. It's hard to function. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the people that must have walked by while Noah and his family was working on this? Think of the lessons that Noah could share with his children through this trust that he displayed in building this boat. There was a lot of lessons, just like us in time of persecution, guys. In time of persecution, it is the most valuable time that we can learn. It is the most, time, most valuable time that we can trust. It's the best opportunity for us to teach others to trust. When we get in persecuted times, when we get in situations, when we face obstacles in our life, when we trust God, Outsiders, and when I say outsiders, I say those that don't know Christ personally, they begin to watch your life through these times. Listen, anybody can watch your life and see there's not a lot to being all that godly when everything's going good. But you put yourself in the middle of a situation. You put yourself, you get in the middle of an obstacle. People are watching you and they're going to say, hey, he trusts or he don't. He trusts or he don't. Your walk is going to be what leads people to Christ. Amen? Noah's trust in knowing God, Noah's trust in it didn't matter about the directions, it, Noah's trust in God Almighty is why I'm sure that there was people maybe walked by when it was all said and done. Listen, let's go to the time when he got on the boat. Do you know, if you go on, I think it's chapter 7, it goes on to say, when they got on the boat after everything was said and done, all the animals were gathered, and it says something that really stood out to me, and I really didn't understand when I first said that, but it says that God shut the door. Think about this. One of the reasons may have been is because Noah, and this is the way I, this is the way I see it from what Noah lived, the example, the influence. This is just my take from him. And I think this is what outsiders, this is what lost people, this is what the world can see in our lives if we're open to look. But I think Noah loved the people that even persecuted him enough that if there'd have been opportunity that he could have cracked that door open, Tony, after everything was said and done and people were drowning in rain or water, I think that he would have cracked the door open and tried to drag people to safety. I think that's how much he trusted God. And I think that God himself had to take the control away from Noah and shut the door. Does that make sense? Again, that's not scripture, guys. That's Mitch's opinion in the trust that Noah displayed and that's what I want us to think about. That's what leads lost people to Jesus Christ. I believe that about Noah. I believe that.
Not to mention that God told him that he would have to gather his food. How many of you went on fall break somewhere on vacation or summer? You go to the beach and pack groceries. And I'm going to be honest with my family. We go to the beach every year and we buy a house. Well, we go and we wash clothes. We cook. We do the whole night. It's not really not vacation. But that's Sonia and Shona. And they can do that. And as long as I'm out on the beach, not listening to them, it's fine. But you know what? We get together about a month before we go on vacation. And for seven days, we've got to plan out meals. We've got to plan out what we're going to take for snacks. And we've got to get all this stuff lined up. And we go to the beach and we have to almost rent a U-Haul to take all of it with us. Well, when we get there, that's why we had kids, because they get to unload it all. And, and I'm telling you, it's a task. But again... Here Noah, through the trust of God, didn't get all tore up and say, man, this is going to be a little longer than seven days, God. i got to work on this. I mean, you know, we get overwhelmed with a little bit of our things going on. But Noah, he shows complete trust. Not only did he have to gather food for him and his family, but he had to corral all those animals. I'm sure he had to use a shovel while he was on this boat. I'm sure that there was jobs that could have overwhelmed him to the point of, God, I don't really understand why that this has to happen. Did Noah ever doubt? Do you think he ever questioned God? We'll never know according to Scripture. But you know what, Tammy? I've often said we're allowed to question God. I think it's okay as a Christ follower to question some of those things. But I'll go a step further. I think it's okay to question, but at the end of the day, when we lay our head on the pillow, I think it's important that we know that he has control. We may not get an answer, but we know that we can trust and know that he is in control of every situation. All right? <laughs> Cell phone. I want to challenge you, all of you this morning, adults, students, leaders, whomever, to embrace the kind of unblinking trust that Noah possessed, okay? What I want to do is I want to give you some reasons of why, and I'm going to close. I, I tell you, it's 1146, I'm going. I want to give you some reasons right now, a few reasons why we can trust God, and I'm going to be quick. Number one, you may want to jot these down if you want to take notes, if you want to mark in your Bible somewhere. Number one, we can trust God because of who God is. When I say that, I honestly think about the people, think about them, think about for a minute the people you most trust. There's people here in your lives, there's people that you would not do anything unless you go to them first and talk to them. Well, I want you to know that that's great. But I also want you to know that there's this fella named Jesus Christ, and he knows all. And he is a reason that we can trust. If you want to, like I challenged our students, and I may have even challenged some of you in my Sunday school class or whatever, if you want to find some reasons to trust, you go to the book of John in your quiet time. You take a pen or you take a highlighter or you take a journal and you start in chapter one. And you, every time as you're reading your quiet time in John, as you start to read, you underline or circle or journal when you read a scripture that involves a reason that you can trust. I'll give you an example. In John three, if you go to the most popular verse, the one that maybe has been taken for granted for the longest, I don't know. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, boop, highlight it, that's a reason that you can trust God. Amen? That's a good enough reason throughout the whole book, but it's full. It shares in John his love for us. It shares in him why that we can trust. It's full of reasons that we can trust. And we can trust God because of who he is. And, and Noah trusted God in the face of extraordinary times, guys. Listen to me. This wasn't an easy task. We've read that. But Noah still continued to trust. How? Because he knew him. I believe that Noah knew God personally enough when God showed up to have a conversation with him from the word go. Noah knew who he was. Amen. From reading his word, we learn who God is. I told, I told our students this, it's not about getting saved and having a garage door opener to heaven. Listen, 
Heaven is the bonus in, in our relationship with Christ. The time that we have with him now to be able to trust him and live with him and depend on him and do things for him, that's what our relationship's about with him. That's why we should want to accept Christ. Heaven is just a bonus. But Noah knew him. He knew him personally. Man, when you read the Bible, when you discover the history of God, keep and listen, it goes back to Genesis. When you learn the history of God going to Abraham and making that covenant, it's throughout God's word. He, do, he makes promises after promises. And listen, do you understand that throughout God's word, every promise he made, never one time, never one half of time was this promise ever broken? the most trustworthy, the most dependable friends that you have this morning, think about them. You must love them with all your heart, but listen, have they ever failed you? Sure, we're human. God threw out his word when he made a covenant, when he promised his people, he never broke it. I'll tell you another and real quick, Abraham must've knew God. He must've knew him pretty well. You know why? because he took Isaac. In the middle of my trust, if I can say so, in the middle of my trust, when God says, you take Caleb or you take Noah up on the hill where the church property is and I want you to build a fire or whatever up there and lay him on there. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm probably gonna run from God. Just being honest. Because my trust is, I believe this is why God this lesson may not even be for you all. It may be all for me. But you know what the word says about, about Abraham? It says that he woke up early. He didn't delay. He didn't question. He didn't fight. He got up early in the morning. And he took his son on a journey to the top of that hill. Man, he, he had knife in hand, guys. He was ready to do it. He knew God. He knew who God was. We can trust God. We can trust him because of who he is. Second, we can trust God because of who we are. That seem a little unusual? You say, Mitch, we're nothing but filthy rags. We're nothing but, we're nothing unworthy. We're nothing but sin. We're nothing but mistakes. You're exactly right. But you can trust God because of who you are. Listen to me today, church. When God sent his son to die on a cross, listen, we got to stop watering this down. When God sent his only son to die to pay the penalty for sin, he made you something. He made you something. And he made me something. Through Christ, we can do all things. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Luke 137. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. That's not just memory verses. That's reality. That is because of who we are. Listen, it's not who we started out to be, but through Jesus Christ dying that you and me could have eternal life, that you and me could trust God in our relationship and live according to the very plan and purpose he called, we become something. Christ followers with a purpose. That's what we've got to teach our children. That's what we've got to teach our coworkers. That's what we've even got to teach our enemies. We can trust God because of who we are. If we've trusted God and asked Christ into our life, we're his children. And understand that God loves his children. Very much. Very much he loves his children. And third, we can trust God because of who we are not. We can trust God because of who God is. We can trust God because of who we are. And we can trust God because of who we're not. Nothing surprises God. You and I, 
we only know what's happened this far, Charles. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But you know what? We serve a God that knows yesterday. We serve a God that knows today. And we serve a God that knows tomorrow. Listen to me. When the path, when the journey, when your walk, when your spiritual walk, when your life becomes cloudy or foggy or dark, know that you can trust God. It doesn't have to be clear to trust God. Listen, the way I like to look at it is, you know, our airplane pilot, one of the final lessons to an airplane pilot, it's pretty easy from what I've understood to fly a plane when you're in clear weather and you've got the instruments to look at that, which I don't know how they look at all of them, but they've got a little thing even on there that shows the wings of the plane and you can kind of keep it straight or whatever you need to do according to that number. But the, one of the final tests in being a pilot is they take aluminum foil or a map or something and they tape it across the whole windows and you get in the cockpit of this plane and you fly it from start to finish according to your controls, according to your instinct, according to what you have learned, according to what you have trusted from your instructor. You get it? We got to trust our instructor. This is how we walk. This is how we talk. This is how we see people come to know Christ is even when the glasses are on that we can't see through, even when the path trails and all that journey is dark, we trust God because He is. We trust God because He is. Would you please stand with me? In closing this morning, I want to make mention that when we trust God, it speaks highly of our faith. I honestly believe that, that our trust and our confidence and our commitment in God, I think that that's what's going to share the gospel with Christ more so than any scripture that you can memorize. And don't get me wrong, Jesus tells us in his word to hide his word in our hearts, that we know it, that we can reflect, and that we, though we can use that in times, but I'm telling you, we have to take his trust and we have to use it, church, and let people see that it's more than just building a boat. It's about flying the plane without always being able to see. That's when God becomes visible to those that need him. Today, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask Jamie to come. He's already here. I'm going to ask him to play.